All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started, everyone. So uh, first off, I want to welcome you to today's webinar on uh, six high-impact Windows Server 2016 Hyper-V features for the SMB. My name is Andy Serwitz from Altera Software, and we've got a bunch of great stuff for you guys today. Um, we're going to be talking about, again, six really high-impact features um, that small businesses can take advantage of inside of their organizations because, you know, small businesses really have some uh, unique requirements when it comes to the world of IT. Um, you know, we're going to be talking about these type of unique requirements here shortly, but, you know, things always come down to, to cost and ease of use and a couple of other reasons we'll talk about later. So um, all of these, these items, all of these features that I'm going to talk about here today um, are done with that in mind. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to talk about these features, and then each feature is going to be followed up with a demo. So hopefully I've made all the necessary sacrifices to the demo gods this morning, and uh, everything is going to go fine with our demos today. So um, we'll, we'll find out here shortly. So first off, let's talk about our agenda for the day. So first we're going to do some introductions of myself and Altero, in case you don't know who we are. And then we're going to talk about what does the SMB want, kind of what I talked about just a second ago. Um, what kind of unique things do the SMB, you know, what, what does the SMB space look for when it comes to IT? Then we're going to get to the topic that you're really here to see today, those six high-impact features that you can go and use with 2016 in your environments today and, you know, get some immediate benefit from those features. And then we're going to follow that up with a uh, just a quick couple minute demo of our new V7 Altera VM backup product. Um, we've got some great features in that, that uh, release that we're really proud of and we just want to show you real quick uh, some of those great features. And then we're going to wrap up the day with some Q&A. Um, now one thing on the Q&A real quick. Feel free to ask the questions in the questions form um, throughout the webinar. I will get to them at the end of the webinar. I'll start going through the list and I'll answer the ones that I can in the time allotted. If for some reason I don't get to your question, we always do a follow-up blog post that contains the webinar recording, so you can rewatch it if you miss it, and it also contains a list of all the questions that were asked and their associated answers. So if your question doesn't get answered live on the webinar today, look for it in the follow-up blog post that comes out in the next week or two um, for that answer. So I'll be sure to get those over to you if I can't answer it in the Q&A today. So let's get to some introductions. Again, my name is Andy Serwich. I'm a uh, technical evangelist for Altero Software, and I'm also a Microsoft Cloud and Data Center Management MVP. Um, you know, I've been in the industry for quite a while, quite a long time, uh, 14 years. Uh, I've worked across all kinds of different industry verticals, Fortune 500 manufacturing, healthcare, professional services, uh, working for MSPs, I work for internal IT departments, um, and especially when it comes to the SMB, my time spent working for a regional MSP here in the Grand Rapids, Michigan area, um, that really does a lot. You know, that, that really contributed a lot to my experience working with SMBs. Because um, MSPs, you know, they spend a lot of time working in the SMB space because a lot of SMBs don't have um, the budget um, or the desire to have their own IT staff on premise. So um, definitely had a lot of experience working with small businesses here uh, in the regional Michigan area. Um, my focus has always been in infrastructure, virtualization, cloud services, the Microsoft server stack. Uh, and my emphasis has always been on Hyper-V. So um, it's my passion. I love talking about it and hope to share some of that knowledge with you today. Um, I do interact quite frequently online in a number of different formats, blogs, social media, published writings. Um, if you're an active Twitter user, my Twitter handle is down there in the bottom left, at acerwitch. And uh, I do blog frequently out on www.altero.com slash hyper-v. So real quick about the uh, company that I work for, um, Altero Software. And Altero Software is a fantastic company. We build um, you know, fantastic backup software. Our virtual backup software is uh, trusted by 30,000 customers, including a lot of SMBs. And our, again, our flagship product, product is Altero VM Backup. If you're interested in learning out you know, learning a little bit more about that product, you can go to altero.com slash vm dash backup. So let's talk about what SMBs want. Let's, let's start talking about our topic for the day. Because like I said, SMBs tend to have a lot of um, unique demands. So one of the first thing 
that SMBs really look for in an IT infrastructure and their IT organization, their strategy, uh, is reliability. Because even though those in the enterprise space, they're a little more resilient to outages, um, it's a little more unique when it comes to the SMB space for a couple of reasons. Um, if you're an SMB, it's quite likely that you have a single location. Maybe you don't have all these different areas, these different buildings that you can fail over to in the event of an outage. Um, so if your main site is down, you're losing revenue. You don't have any diversification. Um, I mean, you're not making any money if that site is down. So uh, reliability is a major, major concern for SMBs. Availability kind of goes hand in hand with reliability, right? Reliability, we want to make sure that stuff is running well and uh, it's, it's running up to spec and up to par for what you need, but availability, like I said already, is kind of the other hand of that. It's got to be available to begin with, right? So that's, that's two kind of go hand in hand. Ease of use is another really important one for SMBs because um, in SMBs, you have a very, you may not have an IT staff at all, or you may have an IT staff that um, has a very specific skill set. They may not be um, well well trained in every facet of your organization. You might might be staffing people that are that are new to IT as a career. Um, so, with that in mind, ease of use is always really important. So, anything that SMBs can do with IT to make things easier, easier to manage, easier to consume IT, uh, anything that that they can do to make things easier um, is is very very welcome. <clears throat> Automation. Um, whenever I have this talk with SMBs, they're always surprised that I put automation on this list because a lot of SMB owners and a lot of SMB uh, IT administrators will, will look at the word automation and be like, oh, you know, that, that's for the big guys. I don't need to be worried about that. And um, my argument is always uh, no matter your company size, no matter the complexity of your IT infrastructure, there is always benefit to be gained from automation in some way, shape, or form. There's always something in your infrastructure that can be automated to make things easier on you. Kind of goes back to that ease of use bullet point, right? So my argument is always, there's always some benefit to be gained by putting automation into your infrastructure. And finally, low cost. Um, SMBs, again, I say kind of unique. Um, low cost is especially important to SMBs because they don't have uh, infinite budget. Now, I'm not saying that enterprise has infinite budget either. I'm just saying that SMBs, it's a more, um, it's more of a concern because they don't have as large of of a business base to uh, to pull from. So, budget is always a concern when it comes to the SMB. And with that in mind, every feature, every demo that you're going to see here shortly, um, it's it's all stuff that can be used with just Windows Server. Um, once you have Windows Server 2016, you can use all of these features for no additional cost. You don't need Virtual Machine Manager, well, System Center Virtual Machine Manager for those that don't know, which is a very expensive product. Uh, you don't need that. You don't need any add-on third-party utilities. Everything I'm about to show you comes with Windows Server 2016. So let's get to the first feature that we're talking about today. And uh, this is one of my favorite ones for ease of use. You'll see in the bottom right-hand corner of some of these slides, I've kind of tagged uh, the icon for kind of which categories I feel that this particular feature falls into. And hot add, remove RAM, and vNIC. This feature really kind of falls into both the availability category and the ease of use. So anyone that's used Hyper-V for any length of time, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2, they know that um, it's always been kind of a pain to add resources on the fly. Uh, with 2012 and 2012 R2, we were given dynamic memory, which, which made things easier, but there are some workloads out there that they don't play well with dynamic memory. Um, there's even some OSs out there uh, that, that don't play well with dynamic memory. So dynamic memory didn't work in every single case. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to add and remove memory uh, why the VM is live. See, before, if dynamic memory wasn't enabled, you actually had to power off the machine, 
make your change and power it back on. So this is really useful from an availability perspective because you can make that change while the VM is running. Your users are still able to utilize that workload. Um, and I put ease of use just because it's really easy as you're gonna see here in a second. So there are a couple of requirements to, to this. Um, the VM that you're targeting for this change must be a generation two virtual machine. Um, and the, the other two bullet points here for requirements are kind of no-brainers. I mean, the host has to have memory to add. Um, and the virtual machine has to have enough uh, unused memory to actually remove if you're actually removing memory. So I mean, if uh, your virtual machine has uh, a gig of memory associated with it and it's currently consuming a gig of memory, the hypervisor is not going to let you pull out the rug on that memory. It's not going to let you remove it. So uh, the utilization has to be less than what you actually want to remove. And I kind of mentioned it's already it's great for situations where dyna dynamic memory can't be used. And um, one other thing to add here, additionally, VNIX can be added in this manner as well. So if you ever wanted to add an extra NIC to a virtual machine, uh, you had to actually power off the machine to do that, which, again, that kind of goes against that whole availability idea, which now you can do it while the machine is live. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually drop into my lab here and show this in action. So I've got this virtual machine, Ando MB HAR1, and let's start that guy up real quick. Should take a second here. I'm actually going to turn my webcam off real quick because I need the CPU. So the, uh, the vir virtual machine is up and running. So let's connect to it. <clears throat> and then we will log into it when it's ready. So the first thing I want to show here is the amount of memory that it's actually configured with and what it's actually using. So you can see that there's a gig of memory associated with this virtual machine and it's currently using about 478 megs of memory, so not a lot. It's a server core box, so it's, it's pretty lightweight. Additionally, without having to actually log into the machine, you can get that same information in Hyper-V Manager by looking down here at the bottom. You can see the assigned memory and you can see the uh, current memory demand as well. So if you want to just quick look and see, um, that's a good spot to do it. But I want to actually modify the memory. I mean, it's really as easy as, as it sounds. Um, come in here to memory and, you know, I don't need a full gig, so I'm going to drop this to 768 megs and hit apply. So now if I go back to Task Manager inside of this virtual machine, you can see my ceiling has dropped now. So Task Manager is reporting that only 768 megs of memory is available inside of the virtual machine, and my change has taken effect. Again, I didn't have to power off the machine for this. I did it live. So very, very useful time saver. Uh, same thing if I want to increase it. If I want to go back, just as simple as going back to that same spot, putting in 10 24, hitting apply, and if I come back here, the ceiling's been raised again. So very simple, easy, nice thing to do when you don't want to take the VM down to add memory. So super, super useful. Now, the same thing applies to NICs. So I'm going to open up PowerShell on this box real quick, and I'm going to get a list of all the current network adapters for this virtual machine. So you can see we've only got a single network adapter associated with this machine right now. If I go back to the virtual machine settings, I can add a network adapter while the machine is live. I say add, and I'm just gonna leave it disconnected for now because that's not important for the demo whether it's connected or not. What's important is, is you will now be able to see that there are now two adapters associated with this particular virtual machine now. So again, did that live, no downtime required, and kind of the same thing for removing it. I can go in here and I can say, okay, this network adapter, not important anymore, get rid of it. And it will give you a warning saying, hey, if you do this, you might interrupt network connectivity inside of the virtual machine, are you sure? Uh, yes, I'm sure, do what I say. Hit okay, 
And if we go back, the network adapter is gone now. So again, two things that you can add and remove to the virtual machine very easily. And uh, that wraps up our first demo. So I'm going to shut down that virtual machine now. And we will get back to our slideshow. Let me change our display settings real quick. Okay, so <clears throat> the next item on our list, skip that slide. Next item on our list, next feature, is the resilient file system. So this is one of my favorite ads um, that Microsoft has done recently. So let's face it, NTFS is old. I mean, really old when it comes to uh, technology. I mean, NTFS stands for uh, New Technology File System, and it's not really new technology anymore. Um, okay, that's a bad joke. Um, <laughs> I should come up with some better material, but really, I mean, think about it. Uh, NTFS has been around forever and ever and ever, and it's been old trusty for us for a long time. But uh, Microsoft's been working on the successor to NTFS, and that is the, uh, the Resilient File System, or ReFS for short. So ReFS has a, a number of different benefits, and um, they really designed it to be the next file system for the next generation of Windows workloads. And uh, the supported workloads currently you know, are Hyper-V and Storage Spaces Direct, kind of those core workloads for our infrastructure. And uh, it's better than NTFS in a number of different ways. I mean, the main thing is faster file system operation for certain workloads, especially those that are virtualized. So VHDs, snapshots, backups, and it's faster with those types of things because it does more background metadata operations than, than NTFS did. So a lot of stuff can be conducted in the background uh, in the file system without slowing things down for the workload that's running on it. And then my particular favorite thing about REFS is um, the fact that it's got built-in resiliency features and it's self-healing. I mean, I, about every administrator that I've ever talked to can say that they've had to take down a, uh, a virtual machine or any workload that runs NTFS to do a, a disk check on it. Um, and, um, REFS should help with that because it's self-healing and I think the days of administrators having to do offline disk checks um, is, uh, is, is coming to an end. So what I wanted to do with REFS is kind of show off some of the performance benefits. Um, I talked, you know, I said earlier that REFS has a lot of advantages when it comes to performance with virtualized workloads. So what I'm going to do in this demo is I'm going to create a fixed VHDX um, first on NTFS, and then I'm going to do the same operation on REFS, and we're going to compare the amount of time that it takes to, uh, to actually occur. So I'm going to end the show here, and we're going to drop into this environment here. So first thing I want to show is that I've got two different volumes here. I've got uh, local C, which is just a standard NTFS file system, and then I've got a ReFS volume here that is REFS. Um, so those are two volumes. And I'm going to use PowerShell in this example to kind of uh, show you the speed differences uh, in the two file system types. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to set some credentials and some targeting variables here. So I'm going to execute those. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm inside of a Hyper-V cluster here, and I'm currently on the domain controller because it's got all my management tools installed on it just for lab sake and lab purposes. Uh, and I'm going to run these commands remotely by calling um, the new VHD commandlet sitting on HV1. So what you see down here below is I'm using invoke commands. I am using PowerShell remoting to run, again, to run this command on target host, which is Hyper-V1. Um, and then I'm calling these credentials that I just saved into the domain credential variable. And then I'm going to execute this block of code inside of the uh, inside of a PowerShell shell on that Hyper-V host. So what I'm doing here, this is the actual command that's occurring. But what I'm doing is I'm actually calling measure command to tell me how long does this, this command execution take. 
So what this is going to do, it's, it's going to execute this new VHD command. It's going to create a fixed VHDX that's 30 gigs in size, and then it's going to tell me how long did it take. So let me actually execute that. Now you're going to see it, it goes pretty fast, and the reason being is in this lab, even the NTFS volume is on flash storage. So it's pretty quick. It doesn't take very long because it's on flash storage. But you'll see here, that operation took uh, 6.89, almost 7 seconds to complete. So not very long, but again, if this was standard uh, spinning disks, it would have taken a lot longer than that. But because this is flash in my lab here, it's, it's still pretty quick. So let me do the same thing now, only using um, the REFS volume. I'm going to actually create the same size VHDX. It's going to be a fixed VHDX again, and I'm going to do it on the REFS volume this time. And let's see what the speed differences are. So let me execute that. And it's done. Much, much quicker. So I've got just over two and a half seconds versus seven seconds. Now, just for that demo, you're probably going to say, Andy, you know, we're talking differences of seconds here. Why is this such a big deal? Well, again, the lab's on flash, so it's going to be a little bit quicker. But even considering flash, think about situations where you've had to create a, a fixed VHD that is terabytes and terabytes and terabytes in size. How long is that taken? With REFS, the amount of time that it takes to actually create that VHDX has been shrunken considerably, so it's a really nice time saver. Uh, additionally, you'll see these types of performance and speed enhancements with, with other virtualization type things, you know, um, with snapshots, backups, and things like that. So uh, there's a lot of benefit here um, that is, is really, really useful. So that wraps up this demo. I'm just going to do a quick little cleanup there to save on some disk space. And we will go back to our presentation. <clears throat> and again, it's going to make me switch my display settings every time here. Okay, so feature number three for today. Now, this is another favorite of mine, especially when I'm thinking about SMBs. Um, start order priorities. Start order priorities. Um, it's it's kind of a feature that we've had in the past with failover clustering in Hyper-V, um, but not really to this degree. Uh, we've always been able to define workloads that are more important than other workloads inside of a failover cluster. But this kind of, like I said, this kind of takes it to the next level. This is really useful in those situations where you've got a collection of virtual machines that they can't, they shouldn't boot, they shouldn't start until, um, until this other group of virtual machines is up and running. So um, the example you're going to see in my demo here in a second is I've got a back-end SQL server um, that a web server requires for it to be up and running. Um, now in the SMB space, like I said earlier, you might have uh, limited IT staff, you might not have any IT staff, you might have Bob in accounting uh, booting up virtual machines uh, in the morning if something goes wrong. and in those situations, with, without start order priorities, um, Bob has to know the exact order in which to start those, those virtual machines, right? Well, what you can do with start order priorities is you can place one or more VMs into a group, a cluster group set, um, and then once everything's grouped, you can actually create dependencies. So you'll see in this, uh, this graph here on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see that at the top we've got cluster group set domain controllers. You see the virtual machines that are part of that group, and you see that there's no dependency. But as you go down to each block in this list, you'll see that the below one depends on the one above it, and the one above it, and the one above it. So in order to start the uh, virtual machine all the way at the bottom, the, all the, the, the groups above it have to be booted first. So it really takes the mysteriousness out of um, starting virtual machines in the proper order. So, you know, in this situation of start order priorities are configured and Bob tries to start, you know, the wrong one first, um, start order priorities will actually ensure that those VMs are started in the correct order. Currently, this is only manageable via PowerShell. Um, and when it comes to Microsoft, you're going to start seeing that in their release cadence. You know, a lot of these new cutting edge uh, features 
they are released in PowerShell only first. So let's actually do this demo real quick. I'll show you how we configure start order priorities, groups, and I'll actually show it in action here in a second. So I'm logged back into my Hyper-V cluster here, and we're going to target, and again, we're going to run these commands on Hyper-V host 1, and we're going to target that, and this time I'm just going to enter an interactive PowerShell session remotely to that machine. So you'll see here at the bottom, I'm now logged in with the shell to Hyper-V 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute these two commandlets here to create essentially empty groups right now. A group is just, uh, just a, an organizational unit, basically. It's just a, a group that you can put virtual machines inside of. So uh, I'm going to create cluster group set for databases and another one for web services. So let me execute those. Okay, that's done. Now, this is where the verbiage gets a little, a little weird with this particular feature. Um, a virtual machine is considered to be a group, which is a little strange to me, um, but I wanted to point it out anyway. So you'll see here, I've got two virtual machines that I'm going to target with variables. So I've got a SQL server and a web server. And then I'm going to add these virtual machines to the two above groups I just created. So I'm going to add my SQL server VM to the databases group. And then I'm going to add the web services virtual machine to the web services group using these, these two commands right here. So let's execute that. And then I'm going to create the dependency. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, OK, I'm adding a dependency with this commandlet to the cluster group set web services. And I'm setting the provider as the databases group. So what this is essentially doing is it's saying anything contained in the web services group set has to wait until the databases group set is up and running. So let's execute that command and let's actually take a look. So we see now we've got the two group names. We've got uh, you know um, databases, web services, and the virtual machines that are contained inside of those group sets. And down here, you'll see provider names, databases. So this tells you right here that web services, this won't start until databases is up and running. So let's actually see this in action. Let's go over to Failover Cluster Manager. And remember, SQL Server is a dependency for, you know, web server can't run until SQL Server is started. So let's just try to start Web 1 and see what happens. So if I start Web 1, you see SQL 1 started first. So we can see that SQL 1 is currently starting. And in about 20 seconds here, you'll see Web 1 start as well. Um, by default, the delay between them is, uh, is 20 seconds. So this should start here pretty quick. <clears throat> so, OK, we see Web 1 starting now. And they're both up and running. So you can see, even though Web 1 was the one I tried to start first, um, the failover cluster manager said, oh, hey, I have dependencies for this virtual machine. i got to go start those first. And it took care of that for me. So uh, really, really helpful feature, um, especially when you have, um, you know, maybe lesser experienced IT staff or maybe people that aren't IT staff trying to start virtual machines inside of your small business. So I'm going to go ahead and shut those down to get them ready for our next demo here. And we'll go back to the PowerPoint. All right. Let me swap my view yet again. And the next one I want to talk about is node fairness. This is a really, really good feature in my opinion. I was happy to see them add this. Um, VMware has had this type of thing for a while. Uh, it was, it's called VMware DRS. And what this feature does is it provides automatic load balancing of virtual machines across a cluster. Um, so you'll see my two pictures down below. Uh, my family were talking about getting a dog. So I use dogs as an example in this, this particular slide. You see Hyper-V node one down there is really working his butt off. He's running around, he's catching frisbees, he's doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And then Hyper-V node two is just kind of laying there being lazy and not really doing a whole lot. So what node fairness is designed to do is to help prevent these types of situations. And 
We've been able to do this in the Hyper-V world before this, but it required System Center Virtual Machine Manager, and it was a feature called Dynamic Optimization. Um, you can still use Dynamic Optimization, and in a situation where both of them are enabled, Dynamic Optimization will disable node fairness um, because you've got VMM in play. But if you're an SMB, you likely don't have VMM, or VMM around, and this is a useful feature because of that. So it's a feature of failover clustering. It's, it's not part of the Hyper-V set. It's part of failover clustering, and it's configurable via failover cluster manager. Um, and there's a couple of different settings. So really, it comes down to an aggressiveness setting, um, low, medium, and high. So it looks at memory and CPU utilization of each host in the cluster. And if it's set to high, for example, once a particular host in the cluster becomes more than 60% utilized, it will actually start moving virtual machines around inside of the cluster to try and get them more evenly balanced. So let's actually show you how to do this, and then we'll move on. So I'm going to go back to my cluster here. And if you want to get to the, 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 the balancing settings, the, the node fairness settings, you have to go to the cluster properties and balancer. By default in 2016 for new clusters, this is enabled and it's set to low aggressiveness. So it's set very conservatively by default. But for the purposes of this demo, I've come in here and I've actually disabled it. So you see that it's disabled for right now. I'm gonna leave it that way for just a second. I've got uh, SQL 1 and Deb 1. So I'm, and they're both on Hyper-V 1 currently. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna power both of those virtual machines on. <clears throat> so make sure both of these are powered up. They're both currently on Hyper-V1, and if I go to my cluster nodes, and I actually look at Hyper-V1, we can see that there's only about a little less than half a gig of memory left available on this particular host. Uh, they're pretty, pretty tiny hosts. So now, if I go back into my cluster settings, and I say balancer, and I enable it, and I set the aggressiveness to high, which again, once a host becomes more than 60% utilized, it will start moving VMs around to get things balanced out. I'm gonna hit apply, go back to roles. Now, I found that it takes a little while for the initial, uh, the initial load balancing to occur. So we're gonna leave it right here for just a couple of minutes and we're gonna move on to our next demo and then we'll come back and check it here in a little bit. So, we'll leave that there for now and we will move on to our next feature. And our next feature being my personal favorite, PowerShell Direct. I absolutely love this feature. I've done so much with it since it was released. Absolute fantastic feature. Um, if you haven't looked at it yet, definitely take a look at it and see what it can do for you. Very, very cool feature. So essentially what PowerShell Direct does is um, it works very similarly to PowerShell Remoting and that it allows you to execute PowerShell code uh, to a remote machine. Only in this case, what PowerShell Direct does is it takes the networking component out of it. Uh, what it allows you to do is it sends that PowerShell script, it send, sends that payload um, across the virtual machine bus of the hypervisor. So if I'm a user here and I've got a PowerShell workload that I need to get to one of these virtual machines, and let's say, one of the, let's say these three virtual machines have no network connectivity right now, but I still got to get this PowerShell workload into that virtual machine. What PowerShell Direct allows me to do is it allows me to send that script through the hypervisor, across the VM bus, and into the virtual machine. So very, very useful, um, especially for deployment operations. Um, this entire lab that uh, you're seeing as part of these demos, I deployed it all in an automated fashion um, using PowerShell and PowerShell Direct. And uh, I'll be publishing that script in the coming weeks out on the Hyper-V blog just so people can kind of see how it, how it works and um, we'll be sure to let you know about that. So let's actually take a look at PowerShell Direct in action. Um, so I'm going to come back into a different lab here and I've got this particular virtual machine that I'm going to start up. <clears throat> Make sure it boots here. And going to connect to it. 
just to make sure it's ready and booted. Should boot pretty quick. They're uh, server core boxes, so they're pretty lean and they boot fairly quickly. So we're applying computer settings and the machine should be ready. There we go. Okay, so the machine's ready. I'm going to drop into PowerShell ISC here and, um, and show you a couple of things. So first, get a list of the virtual machines on this machine. You see all these different virtual machines and the virtual machine that we're gonna we're gonna target with this particular demo is this bottom one. Ando MB PSD1 and it's currently running. I'm gonna set some targeting variables. We've already started the virtual machine but what I really wanted to show here is I'm going to get the status of the virtual machines network adapter so that you can see that the NIC is currently not functional. So you see I've got a 169 address for this NIC. It's currently in a disconnected state. It can't talk to the network. So now I'm going to use PowerShell Direct to actually execute commands against the operating system inside of that virtual machine. So I'm going to capture some credentials here so I can call a little bit later in the script. So let's execute that. Now this is how you actually call and use PowerShell Direct. It's invoke command, just like PowerShell remoting, but you use the dash VM name parameter. So what I'm telling invoke command here is I want to invoke a command against virtual machine and OMB PSD1. I'm going to use these credentials that I just captured, and then I'm going to execute the code inside of the script block. So basically, I'm just going to run this command it will look inside of that virtual machine and it will return the volume information. I'm just using this as an example. So um, while that's running, for people that are concerned about security, they don't want this feature enabled, uh, it is possible to disable that. Um, I'll just mention that while I'm waiting for this to run. Um, usually it takes a second for the get volume command. Let's see, there we go. We got all the different volume information for the, uh, the volumes inside of that virtual machine. Um, another example here, if I want to do the same thing and see if the file server role is installed inside of that particular virtual machine, I can do that too. So I will invoke that command and it will actually look at the installed Windows roles and features inside of that virtual machine and it will report back and let me know if the file server role is currently installed. And installed faults but it's available if I want to install it. So very useful way for getting commands inside of a virtual machine that doesn't yet have network connectivity. Um, I can even do an interactive session over PowerShell Direct. So if I want to enter PS session, VM name, targeting that same virtual machine and using those same credentials, I can do that if I want to. So, and I get inside here just like PowerShell remoting and now I can execute all kinds of commands as if I was actually on PowerShell inside of that virtual machine. So I can get a list of processes that are running. Uh, if I want to, I can get a list of services. Anything PowerShell that I want to do, I can do. So very, very helpful utility. Great for deployment operations. Um, great for any scripting that you have to do that you don't want to send over the network. Again, like I said earlier, even, even SMBs who think they're too small for automation, there is benefit to be had here. So definitely look at it and see what it can do for your organization. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to stop that virtual machine now because I don't want it running anymore. And we will continue on. <clears throat> so the uh, final thing that I wanted to talk about today, the last feature, another one of my particular favorites, is nested virtualization. Um, this is a big one that all of the Hyper-V guys in the, in the community have been asking for for a long, long time. Um, fantastic feature, really happy about it. Essentially what nested virtualization allows you to do, it allows you to run Hyper-V inside of Hyper-V. Um, it's kind of like a, like a Inception, if you've seen that movie Inception, you know, dream inside a dream inside a dream. Um, kind of the same thing with, with Hyper-V here. I can run Hyper-V inside of Hyper-V. Um, which gives you a, a number of different uh, really helpful uh, use cases that you can use. Um, it was primarily created with containers in mind. Um, you know, if you keep track of Microsoft news at all in the world, you know that containers and microservices have been a really big thing in the uh, the Microsoft arena. Um, 
but it's really great for demos, labs, and training. Um, you'll see I marked this slide with low cost, and I did so because uh, when it comes to SMBs, getting equipment to train with uh, or getting equipment to test with is really difficult for those organizations. Um, and that's where nested virtualization can really be of value. So a couple of requirements here. The host system has to be um, Windows 2016 or Windows 2010, or 2010, Windows 10, sorry about that, the client operating system, Windows 10. And the, uh, the virtualized hypervisor um, also has to be one of those operating systems. So I want to show you real quick about how that all works and um, have a bit of a confession to make. As far as demo goes for nested virtualization, you guys have been getting a demo of nested virtualization throughout this entire webinar. The lab that I've been working inside of to show you all these demos is a fully nested Hyper-V lab. So uh, Ando MB TP01, this is my laptop um, running Windows 10. Uh, and you'll see here that I've got a domain controller and three Hyper-V hosts. So these three Hyper-V hosts are all nested Hyper-V hosts running on top of Hyper-V Hyper on my laptop. Um, and they use this domain controller virtual machine here uh, as a DC, and it also acts as an SMB file server for my virtual machine storage. So this is a fully virtualized Hyper-V lab, which is great for testing, it's great for, for demos, uh, just like this webinar, it's great for labs, fantastic feature. And it's fairly, fairly simple to configure as well. Um, just a couple of PowerShell commandlets. So in this situation, uh, let me set some targeting variables again here. I'm going to set my target VM as Hyper-V1. And I'm going to use the get VM processor commandlet. And we're going to look for a particular section here. So I pipe it to select, select object. I want to see all the optional information for the output of Git VM processor. And the really important one here is expose virtualization extensions. You'll see here that it's set to true. Uh, by default on new VMs, that is set to false. What that particular feature does um, is it exposes the hardware virtualization capabilities of the host CPU through to the virtual machine, so those nested hypervisors can take advantage of they can take advantage of the the virtualization contained on the CPU as well. Um, I'm not going to actually run this bottom command right now because I've already done so for this lab. But if you wanted to set this, if you wanted to enable the virtualization extensions for a virtual machine, this is the command you use: set VM processor, the VM name, expose virtualization extensions with true here at the end. So very easy to enable. The other thing that you want to do is you want to go into the NIC settings for that machine, go to advanced features, and you want to enable MAC address spoofing. Otherwise you'll get some weird connectivity issues on virtual machines that are running on this virtualized hypervisor. Um, the other thing that you got to make sure is that dynamic memory is disabled. Um, it works best when you actually fully allocate um, you know, a chunk of memory for the host. So um, those are really the only things you have to do. I mean, as long as the physical host system that all of it's running on um, actually contains the needed hardware, you won't have any issues running that at all. So that wraps up the demo for nested virtualization. Really cool, go try it out. It's a fantastic feature. Now, one other thing that we need to do real quick. I said we'd come back here and Node Fairness has actually made a liar of me, I see. <laughs> when I tested this earlier, um, yesterday and today, it automatically moved the, uh, the various nodes around. So I guess, uh, I guess five out of six demos working correctly is, um, is, is fairly high marks, but um, not really sure. The utilization is high enough. Let me double check my balancer settings here. Yeah, whenever I tested this, it, um, it would move auto, it's supposed to automatically move one of these two virtual machines to one of the other nodes in the cluster. And like I said, it's, uh, it worked perfectly earlier today, so I don't know why it's not doing it now. So um, I guess you guys can virtually throw things at me for, for that one. So um, anyway, let me get back to 
the rest of our slide deck here. Now, so that really covers our six core features that we want to talk about today. And real quick, I want to talk about uh, our new version of Altero VM Backup. Version 7, we just came out with it. Uh, and, we'll, and after this, we'll get to the Q&A here shortly. So again, Altero VM Backup, it's our flagship product. And uh, we really focus on a number of different things. I mean, it's got to be uh, efficient backup set. It's got to be up and running quickly. It's got to be easy to use. Um, you got to have full control of your backups. You know, you can manage and monitor backups across all your Hyper-V and VMware hosts from a single pane of glass. Um, and we've got a new feature out that uh, is called Augmented Inline Deduplication, and I'll talk about that here in a second. And I'm really, really proud of our support team. Our support team is, is top-notch. I think last time I checked, we had about 22 seconds call pickup time for, uh, for phone support. Um, our, our support team does a fantastic job getting help to the people that need it. And it was built specifically for small and mid-market businesses. So I said I'd talk about our new augmented inline deduplication real quick. So what our new augmented inline deduplication does, it ensures that common data is only transferred to the backup or the offsite location one time. We do it in line, we don't do anything post-process, so nothing goes over the wire that doesn't need to go over the wire. Um, and when we tested our new augmented inline deduplication uh, against, and we compared a similar test against competitors out there in the marketplace, we found that ours actually stands up as number one in all of the tests we did. So um, it really significantly lowers your storage requirements, you get faster backups, and less data is actually transferred over the wire. So it's a fantastic feature. So really quick, I'm just going to do a quick three-minute demo of our, uh, of our product real quick, and then we'll get to the Q&A. So I just kind of wanted to show the, um, the dashboard and some of the dedupe metrics real quick. So I've got uh, our product running here in my lab, and it's been established for a while. Um, the backups have probably about a year old, if I remember correctly. Um, <clears throat> taking a second here because my, uh, my virtualized lab is eating up a lot of my CPU. Um, so I'm going to connect to my uh, Altera VM backup instance, and it's going to dump you right out to the dashboard right away. And we're going to get a whole bunch of really useful metrics here. So the first metric that you're going to see here, as soon as it loads, is you're going to see backup drive statuses here in just a second. And if you have multiple backup drives here, you'll actually see multiple instances here, but I only have a single backup drive here in my environment, and you can see that here. So we've got, you know, free space versus use space, and we've got upcoming or active operations, uh, you have recent operations and what the outcome of them was, and then you've got deduplication and compression. So you can see here that based on the data contained in my environment, and I've got quite a few unique VMs in this environment, um, you can see even with pretty unique workloads, I still get a really good savings of 34% based on deduplication and compression. So it's very, very useful. Um, especially, you'll get even better percentages as the workload grows um, because all of that, all those like and common blocks are deduped across the entire solution. Um, by default, it's enabled across all virtual machines, or you can enable it on a per virtual machine basis as well if you'd like. So. Um, again, if you want more information on this, you can go out to altero.com slash vm-backup, and we have all kinds of information and, uh, and, and cool stuff to show you here about our product and about our new augmented inline deduplication. So let me go back to our slide deck here. <clears throat> and not duplicate. <laughs> I messed it up now. One second here. That's what happens when I click a wrong button. Let's go straight like that. And select the correct button this time. Okay. Now it's time for our live Q&A. So, you know, I mentioned earlier, feel free to use the question form um, as the webinar progresses. 
And I see a couple questions out there. If you have any questions at all um, that you know you have from this webinar, feel free to um, to reach out on the questions form and go ahead and ask. So um, one of the first questions that I see here is um, about node fairness. Will node fairness adhere to host placement rules? And really what that question is talking about is um, you know how you can set preferred owners inside of of failover cluster manager. Um, you can make sure that two virtual machines are never on the same host at a time. Will node fairness adhere to those placement rules? And yes, it will. It'll take those rules into account when it's, it's load balancing the cluster. Um, another question that we had here is, um, let's see, the startup delay for start order priorities. Um, when I was talking about that particular feature, um, you saw that the default for the delay between those groups starting up was 20 seconds. Um, that is a configurable option. Um, there is a flag in one of those PowerShell commandments that I showed you that will actually allow you to um, it'll actually allow you to change it to 60 seconds or 40 seconds or 500 seconds, whatever kind of delay you want between those. Um, I could see that being especially useful in situations where you've got like a really really beefy SQL VM um, or an Oracle VM, something that takes a little time to get up off of its feet um, before the next virtual machine comes online. So that's definitely, definitely um, something to keep in mind. That is definitely an option. Um, let's see, other questions here. Um, looking through the list here. <clears throat> Are all those features supported on the free Hyper-V Server 2016 also? Yes, that is correct. Each of the features that I just showed you will work inside of uh, Hyper-V Server, which for those that aren't aware, Hyper-V Server is a, um, a feature option. I shouldn't say a feature option. It's really an addition of Windows Server 2016 that um, it doesn't come with any licensing rights, but it still allows you to run Hyper-V and it's great for open source workloads um, or situations where you already have some sort of licensing that you want to use instead. Um, but definitely, yeah, each of these features that I just showed you uh, will work on Hyper-V server, absolutely. <clears throat> um, let's see. Um, got a question here. I thought you needed to have four gigs of RAM on each nested Hyper-V host. Um, I, I'm not aware of any requirement like that. So, uh, you just saw the, the ones that I was running. I had them all configured with two. So I I'm, I'm, am running the, uh, the uh, testing version of, of Windows 10. Um, the, uh, why can't I think of the name of it right now? Oh, the word escapes me. But um, I've got the test version of Windows 10 running right now. I think I'm in the slow ring. So maybe that's, that's something that has recently changed. But to my knowledge, there's never been a, a minimum memory requirement for a nested hypervisor. Um, let's see. What other questions do we have here? <clears throat> um, let's see. Power down order feature. So the question is, is there a power down order? Um, so similar to the, um, the start order priorities, is there a way to do it in reverse? You know, that's a good question. I don't believe there is a power down priority. Um, not that I've ever seen. I don't believe there is one. But definitely um, check out the follow-up blog post that we're going to put out there. I will verify that and make sure that I get it in the blog post. Um, I don't believe there is. Um, I think I've got time for one more question here. Um, let's see. Can you share the scripts power the okay, so the PowerShell scripts that I used in the webinar, can I share them? Yeah, absolutely. I'll be sure to include everything that you saw in the webinar. I'll be sure to put that out on the blog post as well. That way you guys can uh, can use it. And I mentioned earlier that the nested lab that I showed you, the domain controller and the three Hyper-V hosts, um, I mentioned that I set those up in a scripted fashion. Um, I'll definitely be sure to, to share that script as well. Um, it's a very, uh, and it's a really, really cool script that basically allows you to, um, 
it'll automatically deploy the domain controller. It'll use PowerShell Direct to reach into that virtual machine and configure Active Directory. And then it'll deploy the three Hyper-V hosts, add them to that domain, configure and install Hyper-V. It'll establish the cluster automatically. It'll configure cluster storage. Um, and then it'll be completely ready for you to start putting virtual machines on top of that cluster. So um, when I tested it last, I think I had a full virtualized cluster um, with the script being set up in about uh, 20 or 30 minutes. So um, it's great in those situations where you want to deploy a, a quick virtualized cluster, tinker with a bunch of stuff, break it, do whatever, rip it down, and then use the script to deploy it again. So it's really, really useful in those situations. So um, blog address, um, if you want to keep an eye out for that follow-up post, uh, the blog is uh, www.altero.com slash hyper-v. Uh, you see it right here on the screen at the top here if you want to quick copy it down. Um, also, if you think of follow-up questions that you want to, to send over, you know, you can send it to, uh, to one of these emails here. Or if you have questions about the product, feel free to send it to sales at altero.com as well. Um, and with that, I think I'm just about out of time. Oh, one other question I want to address to you real quick is, can you share the presentation slides and scripts? Absolutely. Uh, as part of that follow-up post here, probably in the next week or two, um, I'll be sure to get everything that you guys saw here today out on, as part of that post. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll probably get an email sent over to you when that's, when that's ready. So, well, with that in mind, I am all wrapped up for the day. I want to say thanks to everybody for attending. I uh, hope this was really of, of value to you guys, and hopefully you can take some of the features that I showed you today back to your environments and, and hopefully get a little sanity back for uh, you know, some of the time savings and some of the ease of use stuff that these, uh, these features provide. So again, want to say thank you, and I'm going to sign off, and have a great day.